Jan Napolitano was named president of the University of California system in 2013, the 20th person to hold that distinction and the first woman to oversee the 10 campuses, five medical centers and three nationally affiliated laboratories along with statewide agricultural programs that make up the UC system. And it's a testament to her distinguished career in public service that we are probably going to forget all of that and talk about the things that she did before 2013 and her life before being named the UC president. Ms. Napolitano grew up in Albuquerque before attending Santa Clara University, where she graduated summa cum laude in, public, in political science and was the university's first female valedictorian. From there, she went on to a career that most GSPP students would only aspire to, that of a budget analyst. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but she was in the Senate where most of our alums are in the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, as hard as it must have been to leave the numbers, she went on to pursue and received her law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law. And now here is where we get to the GSPP Goldman School moniker of Speak Truth to Power. After spending some time in private practice in Phoenix, then President Bill Clinton named her as U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona. Four years later, Ms. Napolitano ran and won the first of her two terms as the Attorney General of the state of Arizona, which preceded her term as, term and a half, mm -hmm. six years, as the Governor of Arizona. In 2009, she accepted then-President-elect Obama's request to be his first selection as the Secretary of Homeland Security. In addition to leading the University of California, Ms. President Napolitano has been a tenured faculty member at the Goldman School of Public Policy, since 2014, and as we're about to discuss, she has taken her faculty role very seriously in writing a book that we will all just hear about. Janet Napolitano discusses her time as Secretary of Homeland Security in How Safe Are We? And she provides insights into the politics of national security and offers policy, policy solutions to help keep Americans safe against threats ranging from natural disasters to domestic terrorists. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce the president of the University of California and former Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Orville. And I want to thank the forum, too, for having me here today, and all of you for coming. Um, I'm just going to make a few introductory remarks. Um, but uh, one of the first questions uh, I get is, why did you write a book and why now? Um, well, I wrote a book because I'm a tenured professor. <laughs> and you know, tenured professors write books. Um, and you know, I'd always wanted to write a book. Um, but um, with some distance from my time at the Department of Homeland Security, it's given me some time for thought and reflection uh, in terms of what we did while I was there. Uh, and, and what is the state of Homeland Security today? And are we focused on the real risks that confront the country, the safety and security uh, of Americans? Or um, uh, are we uh, kind of being distracted by uh, security theater? Um, so uh, by way of example, what do I think are the main risks affecting Americans today. I would put it in, in three buckets. Uh, one, uh, most people would not think of in the Homeland Security context, but we should, uh, and that is global warming or climate change. Um, uh, we are seeing uh, the increasing incidence of uh, extreme weather events, landfall hurricanes, greater numerosity and intensity of tornadoes, uh, drought in the West, uh, leading to massive wildfire, which of course uh, we've been experiencing here in California, and rising sea levels uh, on, on all the coasts. Um, and uh, 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 those all affect safety and security, uh, how we respond to those disasters, how we adapt to the climate change uh, that already has occurred. Uh, more lives have been lost uh, due to these kinds of events in the last decade uh, than have been lost to any kind of terrorist incidents. So uh, in terms, if you, if you say that Homeland Security is uh, to protect the safety and security of Americans to the greatest extent possible without guarantees, there are no guarantees in the security business, 
um, uh, uh, those associated with global warming, climate change, need to be taken into account. And by the way, uh, backing up even further from uh, 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 weather, uh, what, what we see is the effect of global warming on uh, migration patterns. Um, we're in the midst of a really a massive uh, global migration from south to north. Uh, we've also seen incredible um, uh, uh, incidents of drought uh, in areas of the world uh, where drought has essentially destroyed the local agricultural economy. Uh, that means no markets, that means no jobs, that means lots of young men, uh, hopeless and jobless, who are themselves ripe for terrorist recruitment. So climate change has a lot of impacts where security and safety are concerned. The second major category of risks I would put under the heading of cyber. Um, and you know, when I began as Secretary of Homeland Security in 2009, I spent maybe 10% of my time on cyber-related incidents. Um, by the time I left, uh, towards the end of 2013, uh, it was easily 40% of my time. We were seeing uh, uh, greater uh, numbers of attacks on our critical infrastructure. Um, hacking. Um, we hadn't yet seen an attack on our democracy, but we have now seen that in the 2016 election where I think we can um, all conclude that uh, if there's um, anything um, that there's pretty universal opinion on, it's that the Russians were all over our 2016 election uh, and they were um, hacking the Clinton emails, um, they were planning false and misleading stories using social media, all designed to benefit candidate Trump over candidate Clinton. Um, uh, so um, we, um, I, I won't go into it at this point, maybe in the Q&A, but uh, cyber, I would say, is the second major uh, area of risk. And then the third area is uh, massive gun violence. Uh, gun violence where there are uh, a number of victims. It can be motivated by a lot of different things. It can be motivated by uh, Islamist uh, propaganda uh, taken uh, into account on social media. It can be motivated by white nationalist, right-wing extremism. We're seeing an increase in that. It can be just a, a, a function of some sort of weird pathology. But the fact of the matter is, is that we do not have a good handle from a prevention and early intervention uh, standpoint where these incidents of mass gun violence are concerned. So I would put those three things in the category of real risks facing the American people. What isn't a real risk facing the American people? Conditions at the Southwest border. Uh, the border is a zone. I know that border very well. I grew up, as Orville said, I grew up in New Mexico. I spent the bulk of my adult life in Arizona. I have walked that border. I have ridden it in horseback. I've flown it in helicopter and fixed wing aircraft. Um, uh, and uh, I will tell you uh, that, first of all, you cannot seal that 1940 mile border. Um, which uh, traverses a lot of varied terrain. It traverses public lands and private lands and sovereign Indian lands. Uh, so building a wall uh, is a, it's a symbol, but it's not a strategy for how we actually uh, provide border security. Uh, what do we need by way of border security? We need manpower between the ports of entry. We need technology. Um, ground sensors, tunnel detection equipment, things of that sort. Um, we need to strengthen the actual ports of entry uh, through which hundreds of thousands of vehicles travel every day. The U.S.-Mexican border is the most heavily traveled land border in the world. Um, and literally millions of dollars of commerce go through those ports every single day. The bulk of the illegal narcotics that come into our country come through those ports of entry, not between the ports, not where a wall would be uh, constructed if there is to be a wall. So um, by focusing so much on the conditions at the southwest border, which I will grant you need to be managed, and uh, they're in a particularly difficult state now, but there's things that we can do to, to manage our way through that. 
uh, but by overly focusing on that and not focusing on the real risks facing the American people, we are indeed less safe. We are indeed less safe. How safe are we? Well, in some areas, we are safer now than we were before the attack of 9-11. I would say that it is now impossible for a foreign national to come to the United States, go to flight school, take over a commercial airliner, weaponize that airliner, and fly it into an iconic building like the World Trade Center or the Pentagon. We've, we have really stopped the capability for individuals to be able to do that. And we've done a lot uh, more in the aviation security realm. You know, one of the things I um, uh, regret uh, is um, by the time I left as secretary, we, we were not able to figure out airport security so that people could leave their shoes on and bring their liquids onto planes. If we'd been able to do that, I'd be running for president. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the technology just didn't exist uh, in a way that allows us to keep moving passengers uh, through the line. So the alternative we, uh, we uh, uh, constructed was a system of uh, validating passengers before they actually got to the line, checking them out ahead of time to see uh, whether there were any kinds of red flags from a security standpoint. Uh, and hence was born TSA PreCheck, uh, and now, if you're in pre-check, raise your hand. Okay, we did pre-check. Um, and uh, um, that um, uh, has really uh, uh, helped uh, a, a number of travelers with airport security as we work uh, with vendors to try to get the technology improved so that air travel is more convenient. Um, uh, another thing we were not able to accomplish, and this is probably the most controversial area that uh, DHS is concerned with, is immigration and immigration enforcement and immigration reform. Uh, we uh, worked very hard with Congress to try to get uh, comprehensive immigration reform legislation through. We got some through the Senate. The House refused to take it up. Uh, uh, we tried to get a, a DREAM Act uh, passed, and when that uh, was uh, not able to pass the Congress, we developed DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, uh, which was announced by the President in June of 2012, and we were up and running by August, 60 days later, light speed by government standpoints, light speed. Um, and we didn't know on day one whether we'd have 50 or 500 or 5,000? Well, today there are some 850,000 uh, DACA um, students who are protected from deportation under that program and get work authorization. Um, and there are several thousand DACA recipients who are part of the University of California community. You know, when the Trump administration announced that it was going to rescind DACA because it was, quote, illegal, by the way, I am a lawyer. It is not illegal. Um, uh, the University of California um, took really the only route available to us. We sued the administration to get an injunction against the rescission of DACA. Uh, we obtained that injunction. The injunction's held through the Court of Appeals. Uh, the Supreme Court has so far refused to hear that case. And so while that injunction has been in place, uh, 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 hundreds of thousands of DACA recipients have been able to keep in the program, keep re-enrolling in the program and the like, but ultimately the solution is going to have to be in Congress. And uh, I think the likelihood of that in the near future is unfortunately very, very low. So uh, not able to complete being able to take your, uh, leave your shoes and take your liquids onto planes, not able to uh, engage uh, the Congress uh, in a successful comprehensive immigration reform effort and so uh, developing things that would help mitigate um, that from uh, the pre-check pre program to DACA and, and the like. And those stories I relate in my book as well. Uh, my life and times at DHS and some about my life and times uh, before I got to uh, the department. So uh, with that, um, I will uh, stop and uh, we'll start uh, with the Q&A part of the program. Can we get a round of applause for President Napolitano?
Thank you again for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come here and speak to us at the Goldman School of Public Policy. It's an honor to be able to have this conversation with you. To start off, you've argued that political blind spots abound in social media, which have allowed someone say right-wing organizations to post recruitment content or misinformation that continues to possibly jeopardize national security. In your mind, how should companies like Facebook or YouTube moderate potentially harmful content given the constraints of the First Amendment and free speech? So I think there are things that the, 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 the major um, platforms can do. And, and uh, I was pleased to see last week that Facebook announced that it was uh, removing um, sites that you would find using particular search terms associated with right-wing extremism, white nationalism, um, and that if people put in those search terms, they would get referred to an anti-hate crime uh, website. Um, I, I think that's a good step in the right direction, maybe a bit slow to the ball, uh, but um, I think it's very clear that uh, where social media is concerned, uh, uh, there is a, a huge role for the providers, uh, those who uh, uh, fund and make money off of the platforms uh, um, to um, exercise some judgment. Um, uh, and of course, it, it becomes difficult in the gray areas, uh, given the First Amendment. But remember, the First Amendment was designed to protect freedom of speech from control by the government. Um, and this is really not the government. This is the private sector. This challenge of trying to regulate the gray area becomes even more complicated as you try to work with international partners. And one of the challenges of fortifying cybersecurity worldwide is that it requires global cooperation among countries that may not have the best relations. How would you recommend or advise this administration to work with countries like China, for instance, that it may not have the best relations with when it comes to these issues of cybersecurity and cyber infrastructure at large? So cyber is international. Um, cyber doesn't respect national borders. Um, and um, I, I think you, we start with uh, developing uh, stronger rules of the road uh, with our allies um, and recognize that this is not a US go it alone, but this is the US as part of a community of nations. Um, and, you know, uh, similar to uh, what, what we have done in the uh, disarmament realm, uh, what we have uh, done in the post-World War II era, um, that there can be a, a, a negotiated set of principles uh, among, say, the United States and the countries of the EU. Uh, uh, to, to at least begin building out an international framework uh, for how cyber is to be weighed and judged, um, what constitutes uh, an act of cyber warfare, uh, what are the kinds of graduated sanctions that uh, could be deployed by whom and who decides. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Fortunately, that's all the time I have. I'd like to turn the floor over to Orville Thomas to carry on with the rest of this audience Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take our seats. And please feel free to write down comments or questions on your cards as appropriate. We'll have staff kind of circling the room and handing them to me as we can. Uh, kind of in the news today, there was a subpoena for the staffer that ignored the long time concerns about security clearances in this White House. How does that process work? Do you have any comments on the process that may have been ignored for this current White House in security clearances? Yeah, and, and, and you know, security clearances, um, you know, they're serious business because uh, at the right level of clearance, you get access uh, to um, increasingly classified levels of, of information. And, and so uh, the process, as le at least um, to the extent I was familiar with it, was very rigorous. Um, uh, it began by filling out this form called an SF-86, uh, which um, 
is extremely detailed um, and goes way back in your personal history. Um, uh, and uh, uh, then there is a visit from an FBI agent or two uh, to go through your SF-86 uh, with you. Uh, and then they are also uh, checking. They're checking uh, your presence on social media. They're, they're, they're uh, interviewing prior classmates, uh, coworkers, other people who have known you. Um, and uh, then, they, then um, uh, that material is all sent to the White House uh, where it is gathered and analyzed for things like conflict of interest, uh, potential of foreign interference, blackmail, um, uh, other, other issues that could impact um, a person's uh, uh, ability to, um, or, or uh, desire to have uh, a security clearance. Um, and then there's a staff of professionals uh, in the White House um, uh, that go through everything and, and they, they give you, your, uh, in a way, your security ticket. Uh, and there are different levels of clearance uh, uh, that you get. Um, uh, it sounds like from today's news, um, last night's news, is that that process has really been distorted in the current White House and uh, that uh, the analysis done by the, the career officials whose job it is to make sure that those who get access to the nation's secrets are capable of receiving uh, that information in an uncompromised fashion, um, uh, but uh, instead um, are just simply uh, you know, with uh, with the White House wave of the wand, um, reversing those decisions. I think I think that's a matter of grave concern. I'm glad Congress is actually doing some oversight here. So it's um, you know we've kind of heard about it the last few years, but uh, this really puts a point on it. Um, Twenty five uh, overrulings of the um, of the the national security staff in the White House uh, for security clearances, ne not heard of before, unheard of. You know. It kind of comes down to some of the closest advisors to the president. What kind of conflicts and positions does that put them in if that foreign power does have either lending practices to businesses or continues to have back channel conversations with them? So, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, the conflict of interest um, and the financial conflict of interest is, you know, is pretty clear. If you have an ongoing business relationship with a foreign adversary, um, and at the same time, you're getting a, a top secret um, intelligence about that adversary. Uh, there, there's a legitimate question about um, uh, the, the, the way that you can handle or process that, that information. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the security clearance process itself needs to be so carefully adhered to. You touched on the changing migration patterns, and we have a Goldman professor that makes that his life's work. As this climate change continues to worsen, especially in parts of Central America, and we start seeing the migratory patterns come north, how do we balance the humanitarianism versus the homeland security portions? So that's really the, the, the issue of the day, right? Um, uh, right now, at the southwest border, we have an influx of um, families with children uh, coming from northern, the northern countries of Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, who are fleeing really desperate conditions in, in those countries and coming to the United States, exercising their legal right to claim asylum. Now, um, what's amazing to me it, is that it, it looks like the administration kind of just woke up and said, oh my gosh, all these people are showing up. Uh, it, this was an entirely predictable over the last months. And I think it would have behooved the administration to do some preparation, uh, you know, construction of humane facilities, uh, flooding the zone with the rule of law, putting more immigration judges right at the border, um, um, making sure that uh, s staffing is adequate at the ports of entry and between the ports of entry. Um, um, but now it's almost, it's like, well, they're here. Um, and so uh, we have this uh, so-called um, crisis. I think we can manage our way through this crisis. I think we also need to take a step back 
and say, well, what are the sources of this migration? And the sources are um, violence and the failure of civil institutions in, in, the, in the home countries. And um, this is where the United States could really help um, we can, uh, and, and we've shown we can do it in other cases, um, uh, really uh, strengthen civil institutions, the judiciary, law enforcement, um, uh, uh, reduce gang violence. We did something in Colombia to that effect. So Colombia was a narco state. Uh, we worked with Colombians who didn't want to live in a narco state. Uh, and uh, really changed the economy there and, and uh, uh, the institutions of government. And, and now Colombia is essentially a tourist destination. So we know that there are things that can work. It takes time, it takes dedicated resources, it takes intentionality. Um, but uh, I, I think we would be better served looking at the problem from that standpoint as opposed to simply cutting off all aid. It's interesting because you know we're in a policy school and we've learned that the aid is what really helps people in their home countries instead of having this kind of pathway to our southwestern borders. But we don't see this administration really going towards those longstanding proven policies. In your role, how much advice would you be able to give as a former Homeland Security Secretary to the current administration and do they even ask? Uh, no, I'm not getting any calls from the Trump administration. <laughs> I haven't picked up my phone and you know heard, hey Donald here, um, uh, um, uh, you know. But 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 I'll tell you uh, in a, in a way that that's uh, too bad because uh, security of, of any of the kinds of issues that are, are governmental functions, security should be nonpartisan, right? I wasn't the Secretary of Homeland Security for Democrats or for Republicans. I was the Secretary of Homeland Security for the country. Um, and uh, this, is, this is one area where uh, our riven partisan politics, uh, I, I think, actually make us less safe. One of the things I enjoyed reading in the book was, as a former governor, you were able to interact with the federal government during times of disaster and natural disaster, and also pull together local governments and tribal governments. As we have this, in California especially, where we see more fires and we're seeing the flooding throughout the Midwest and the hurricanes, how much stronger is FEMA going to have to be and be appropriated funds to deal with this threat? Yeah, so um, when I took over at DHS, I'll share with you that uh, FEMA was still in a post-Katrina funk. Um, and you could tell that because when you went to uh, New Orleans, uh, the FEMA employees wouldn't wear their FEMA polo shirts because uh, people would, you know, come and yell at them uh, because you know there had been such a failure of government at all levels, state, local, and, and federal. And so we really took it upon ourselves to kind of rebuild FEMA. Uh, we we hired a great director, Craig Fugate, who was head of emergency management from Florida, uh, and we began recasting FEMA. Uh, uh, not to be the first responder. Your first responder is going to be local law enforcement, local EMTs, local fire, um, but to be kind of the uh, where where you can the pre-event planner and preparer, and then to come uh, in and support uh, local authorities where a disaster um, uh, caused so much damage it, it was beyond beyond them, uh, and. You know, we worked through a number of um, big disasters. Uh, um, the British Petroleum oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, very um, a huge environmental disaster, um, uh, affected lots of jobs, uh, lots of livelihoods along the Gulf Coast, among other things, plus the environment of, of the Gulf, um, uh, up to and including Superstorm Sandy, which was a, a hurricane uh, in 2012 that um, came uh, up uh, the eastern seaboard. Uh, the storm covered a geographic area the size of Western Europe. And the hurricane came right into New York Harbor and took out lower Manhattan, um, uh, destroyed the electric power infrastructure in New York and New Jersey, um, just a massive disaster. Uh, but you know, by then, FEMA was uh, able to kind of manage it. And 
uh, was, was able to um, uh, think creatively. So for example, uh, the storm uh, broke off all the utility poles, um, and so there was no electricity. No electricity, that means uh, gas stations, um, uh, you can't get gas out of the tanks because they run on power. And so um, gas stations that didn't have generators couldn't provide gas, so you had these huge uh, long lines for, for gas. Um, and so uh, we, we ended up getting utility crews from all over the country, getting the Department of Defense to uh, load crews and their trucks and all their equipment onto these big C-17 cargo planes, fly them to the East Coast so that we could, as quickly as possible, restore uh, power. Um, that simply was not a capability we would have had in 2009. What I worry about watching FEMA now is a little bit of backsliding. Uh, so we had all of the landfall hurricanes in 2017, the ones in Texas and in Florida and Puerto Rico. And, and look, Puerto Rico it was a, a difficult place to service. You know, you got to cross the, the water, et cetera. Um, and that, the hurricane that hit Puerto Rico took out everything. It was almost Katrina-like in terms of the level of uh, destruction. But we can do better than what we're doing in, in Puerto Rico, and, and we ought to do better. And uh, I worry that uh, our failure to do so is you know, casting doubt on, on FEMA's ability to respond to other emergencies. A okay. uh, question I'm seeing a theme of is kind of the comment, we feel safer, or we are safer now than pre-9-11. I know, as a person of color, the rise of white nationalism, populism, and also some interactions with law enforcement at the local level make it not that safe. How do we comment to a large group of Americans that feel very threatened within their borders and in their local communities? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I think um, one of the most difficult issues we have in our country today is the relationship between minority communities um, and police. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also the rise of white nationalism. Um, and so, um, you know, there are, there are lots of communities that have, you know, good relations um, uh, between law enforcement uh, and, and the minority community. Uh, but too many of our communities um, uh, where, where we have unexplained uh, uh, shootings uh, 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 by police on uh, persons of color. Um, and uh, just a, a kind of a, uh, a growing skepticism about uh, how law enforcement goes about doing its, its work. Um, uh, you know, I, I think communities ought to look for any way possible to encourage active engagement between communities of color and police departments. I think police departments ought to be out in neighborhoods. I think they ought to know who's in the neighborhood that they're uh, watching over. Uh, I think they ought to invite people into stations uh, so they can uh, you know, uh, get familiar with that. I think, I think ride-alongs uh, uh, make sense. Um, I do think um, the greater use of body cameras uh, uh, should help. Um, but this is have, gonna have to be a, a, an ongoing uh, 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 engagement that is not gonna be solved overnight. It's gonna require real, um, I'm going to use the word I've used before today. It's, it's intentionality. In other words, you've got to say, look, we've got a problem here. We have to acknowledge it. And as we acknowledge it, we have to plan to address it. Coming off of that, we have an administration that seems to kind of go in two different directions when they talk about terrorist acts or crime, depending on who com commits it. Mm -hmm. We have very fine people on one side and on both sides. And then we have a very blatant use of demagoguery for people at the southwestern border. How do we have, as communities, the ability to grow, even if an administration and a Homeland Security director and secretary 
aren't going to label white nationalism and populism the same way they are going to label the southwestern border as terrorism? Um, well, um, look, elections matter. Uh, and uh, <laughs> um, absolutely. And um, uh, uh, but in the meantime, uh, you know, I, I think it but behooves us all to engage, to speak out, um, uh, to work at the local level. Not everything emanates uh, from Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, people can uh, uh, um, exercise power and influence in their own local communities, and we, we need to rely on people to do that. As we talk about our local communities, the census is now less than a year away. How do you see the kind of threat of not of the citizenship question affecting, especially border states. You've lived in three border states now to have people who are scared to fill out the census and not receive those services provided by their presence. What is that as far as a threat to our homeland security? So I think um, you know the, the, the census is, is really one of the most valuable government tools we have. It's, uh, it's how we count the population for purposes of uh, enumerating congressional districts. It's how we uh, decide um, how uh, formula-funded federal programs, how, how those funds flow. Um, and so to the extent there's an undercount, uh, and that undercount particularly affects immigrant communities or communities with large numbers of immigrants, it hurts everybody in, in those communities. Um, you know, there's litigation now on whether uh, um, the Department of Commerce is, um, uh, has properly uh, added at the last minute without vetting uh, a citizenship uh, question uh, to the census. Um, um, but um, I, I fear that if it's left on there, there'll be a serious undercount and it will affect California, may cost California a congressional district. Thank you. This wouldn't be a talk about homeland security and the threats that we face if we didn't have nuclear war questions. As we saw escalation of conflict between India and Pakistan, what do you see as someone who's well-versed? Is the threat increasing? I know Governor Brown is very public now with his proclamation that the nuclear clock is getting closer to midnight. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think Governor Brown's right. Um, and, uh, um, and, and we see kind of the backtracking from uh, our arms control treaties. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I'll say that um, I'll regr I regret our withdrawal from the Iran nuclear accord. Um, it, it, it wasn't uh, perfect, but it certainly went a, a long way to ensuring that Iran wouldn't be able to produce weaponizable uh, uh, uranium without a, a really long lead time and red flags that uh, would prevent, uh, or would, would allow for early intervention. Um, and you don't have a substitute for that. Uh, um, you know, think what you will about uh, the president's summits uh, with North Korea. Um, yeah, um, uh, um, but uh, I think the, the, you know, the North Koreans seem intent on adding to their nuclear arsenal. Uh, and I think that is a, a, that's a danger uh, um, to the United States, a danger to the world. So um, I, I do think um, uh, we, have, we have cause to be worried about that. Okay. And you stole my next question on North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that we have here are about small startup companies and efficiencies. And you know, being at the head of a very large and new you know, governmental branch, essentially, and bringing in all these agencies, what are your thoughts on making government more lean? How do we get Homeland Security and FEMA to maybe embrace some of the technological improvements that we're seeing throughout the Bay Area that they can offer those services then to government? Man, I, you know, I actually, um, Okay, I'm at the Goldman School, so I can get a little uh, weedy or nerdy here. But um, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, frankly, gets in, in the way of better use and better technologies in government is the whole government contracting process. Um, 
you know, by the time uh, you uh, get a, you know, write a contract, get it approved, get it through all the processes, um, the technology has already changed. Um, and so you're constantly behind the, the, the eight ball. Uh, I think it would be great if uh, you know, the government had kind of a, 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 a speed tech um, approach um, uh, where agencies were granted leave to, uh, um, uh, I want to say ignore, but uh, skip over some of the government contracting laws uh, in order to facilitate uh, the acquisition of new, uh, new technologies. You know, and, and, and then you can reverse engineer after the fact and see whether um, uh, you actually saved money, became more efficient, and all the things you were trying to uh, attain. But uh, um, the, the other thing um, is I think uh, uh, big federal agencies ought to break uh, contracts down into smaller parts. Um, because the larger the contract is, it limits the kind of vendor who can compete for the contract, uh, and it keeps out uh, small and entrepreneurial companies who may have a better idea. Uh, and, and so I, I actually think better kind of contract design at the outset would make a difference. Okay. Uh, a question from the audience. What is your vision for dealing with the threat of climate change? And is the collaboration between the UC and, I'd say, Singapore universities on climate issues part of the solution? Yeah, so um, uh, I, th I think on climate, we have to, to, to approach it from two directions. One is, I think, as a country, we ought to re-engage with the other nations of the world, all of them except for, I think, Syria, uh, which are now... Uh, committed to the goals of the Paris Accord and do our part to uh, reduce um, uh, the carbon that we're emitting into the atmosphere and by that to reduce the rate by which the planet is, is warming. So rejoining the community of nations where climate is concerned. But the second thing we need to do is really think about adaptation to the climate change that already has occurred. Um, how do we build our roads? What kinds of uh, building materials do, do we use? How do we site communities uh, that have been uh, destroyed by extreme weather? Do we simply rebuild them where they were? Um, or do we um, incentivize their construction elsewhere? Where do we put our airport runways? I mean, every time I take off from Oakland, I look over and there's, there's the water. Um, and, the, and the water's rising. So. Um, uh, I think uh, 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 a focus on adaptation is, is very important, and I think universities can contribute um, to research in that area. And uh, I do think um, uh, uh, we have signed uh, a number of partnerships uh, around the, uh, the world um, uh, where climate, climate research is uh, concerned, including with uh, several in Singapore. I was just there a few weeks ago. Um, and when you see what's going on in Singapore, it's amazing. I mean, Singapore is, is a country at the world probably more at risk from rising sea levels than almost any other country you can imagine. Uh, and so um, it, it, everything there is focused on climate and climate change. And um, you, you can't talk to anybody who isn't aware of the issues and what the country of Singapore is doing about it. I think some of those ideas we could import to the United States. You know, we had this conversation and you talked about the grants and programs that the United States can offer to help emergency economies or stabilize some economies. How do we do that and really maintain that balance on you know, not trying to recolonialize or just put ourselves into countries where maybe we're not welcome? What's the process for that aid being dispersed, and is there a request being made behind the scenes, or how does that work? So, um, you know, um, uh, one of the things that I, I think is not commonly understood is that, for example, in Central America, we're, we're not giving, uh, we're not writing checks to the governments of Guatemala and Honduras and uh, Salvador. We're supporting nonprofits um, that are working in those countries. Um, and actively engaging um, uh, with the nonprofit world. And I, I think um, uh, you know, that uh, can be 
uh, an effective way to uh, engage and to disperse our, um, our, our foreign dollars, as it were. We talked about content and social media. How do we kind of use our emerging technologies to benefit? How do we get everyone now, or a good amount of people, to understand the threats of something like climate change by using the Facebook and you know, Instagram and other platforms that we have available around a common, and I realize I called it the Facebook, please don't make fun of me for being, <laughs> I'm, at, I'm at the older end of the millennium spectrum. Uh, so how do we use social media to rally everyone around this really common enemy, similar to how in the Cold War we had campaigns that you know, garnered community support and really made the efforts clear of what we needed to do? So um, uh, are you thinking that we would uh, assemble um, together uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and et, et cetera, et cetera, and say, OK, we want a campaign on climate change. You know, go for it. Um, I'm, I'm thinking in like Game of Thrones world where winter is coming and it's happening now. How do we get everyone on the same side? to fight the greater threat. Yeah, so um, that's an interesting idea in the Game of Thrones analogy is a good one. Um, uh, you know, I, you know it, it's, it's interesting because my experience has, has, has been uh, that when you reach out and you in, engage with the private sector, um, that um, you typically get a good response, that they're looking for ways to be constructive and to be active contributors, and they have their own ideas they can bring to the table. Um, but you need leadership. You need to exercise that convening authority of office to get people together, to get companies together, to kind of mobilize those efforts. And you're not going to be able to do that if you deny the fact that climate change is occurring in the first place. Uh, so you know we need a little reality check. And this is going to be one of the last questions. California has decided to go it alone on lots of issues in this Trump administration. As we talk about California's leading on climate change and immigration policy and even some homeland security versus humanitarianism at the border, can you talk about the hopefulness that we might have? You know, it's a dire subject, but maybe we could leave everyone with a nice hopeful message. <laughs> After we've discussed nuclear war and uh, the overheating of the planet, et cetera. It's only yeah. lunchtime, too. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. It's, so, it's a long time today. Um, look, California is, is a very um, special place and a unique place. Um, uh, and it has uh, the size and scale uh, to do things that, frankly, a lot of other states can't do going, going alone. Um, and uh, uh, it, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting. California politics, um, uh, you know, are, are blue, um, uh, by and large, but not uniformly so. Uh, California is um, uh, uh, a state that has the greatest amount of in income inequality of any state. Uh, one of the highest rates of children living in poverty of any state. Uh, and, and yet we have uh, great wealth and we have um, uh, great instincts um, as, as a state. Um, and so I think uh, California leads by way of example. Uh, and um, uh, you know, California in some respects is, is a grand experiment um, in a lot of different ways. University of California is a grand experiment. You know, can you have a, a, a great um, uh, public university that teaches and researches at the uh, at the highest level, uh, yet where you know 42% of the undergraduates are first in their families to go to college, and almost 40% of the students are Pell eligible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've been able to do it up to now. Um, uh, um, the, the, the question is sustaining, uh, sustaining those efforts, and that's the challenge. And, and from uh, 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 California versus Washington, D.C., uh, all I can say is I'm, uh, uh, 
there are many days where I appreciate that I'm 3,000 miles and three mountain ranges away from our nation's capital. All right. Well, thank you so much. Let's give a big round of applause to President Napolitano. Yeah.